For this next example of static electricity, I'm going to use a balloon. But I need a volunteer. I'll volunteer. Well, actually, I think we're gonna need someone with hair. Ben, come here. Our exploration of electricity begins with... No, not lightning. That was the static electricity video. This video focuses on current electricity, which is much more useful. Let's begin our exploration with a brief look inside an atom. Here, we see electrons whizzing around the nucleus. These electrons are the stars behind electricity. What you need to remember about them is that they have a negative charge, which means that each electron will repel other electrons and be attracted to things with a positive charge. If we were looking inside the copper wire that's carrying the electricity to your computer right now, we would see electrons of copper atoms move from copper atom to the next as they try to get to the positive. That's all electricity is. Electrons moving through a wire. Isn't it amazing how we have been able to harness the power of these tiny electrons in so many ways? Just think of all the devices in your home that run on electricity. Now we hope you're plugged in and ready to learn about things like batteries, motors, insulators, conductors, electromagnets, plasma balls, circuits, and much more. Are you ready? Here we go. Oh, hello. Uh, my name is Luigi uh, Gavani. Uh, you interrupted my uh, famous experiment on the dead frog here. He had no head. This one does. But when I was uh, doing this experiment, uh, I was using uh, two different types of metal. And I was, uh, uh, I was dissecting a frog, and uh, juices were everywhere, and it was very messy uh, business. But uh, when I went to touch the metal uh, to the leg of the frog, guess what happened? It moved. I couldn't believe it. I didn't know at the time that uh, uh, everything that's uh, living, uh, well, mammals uh, like us, uh, we have electrical system in our body uh, with nerves and brain, and, and it runs on impulses. And so when I uh, naturally touched the frog's leg, it moved, because the frog also has a nervous system, uh, without the head, of course. It's like a battery. Uh, let me show you an example of that. So look over here. I have a lemon uh, with the uh, uh, nail here, which is uh, zinc. And I have a copper strip here. Now, the nail here has a lot of uh, negative uh, electrons. Uh, and the uh, copper strip, well, not so much. But uh, when I put it into the lemon, what happens? Well, the lemon has acid and it begins to strip the electrons off the, the, uh, the nail. And they begin to flow through and go onto the copper. Uh, let me show you how this works. Ah, look what I have here, huh? Hey, a galvanometer. Uh, named after me, uh, Luigi. Uh, watch what happens when I... Uh, Put to these alligator clips onto the uh, copper and onto the uh, the uh, nail. Oh, do you see that? It's a moving. Now look again. Take it off. Put it back on. Take it off. Put it back on. You know, what's happening here? Well, there's an electric current running from the nail to the copper strip, huh? And then. Uh, this side here could be a, a negative, and uh, this side here could be a positive, like on a battery. And then the electrons are flowing from the nail to the strip. Just like that. It's amazing, huh? It's a science. Well, that's Luigi Gavani for you. Enjoy. <laughs> So after Luigi's discovery about the frog and electricity, 
There was a flurry of scientific discoveries that had to do with electricity. And magnetism got in the picture too. How? Well, Hans Christian Orsted, in the early 1800s, he had a, a wire carrying electricity. And he happened to take a compass. And he put the compass near that wire and the needle, which we know is magnetic, and is attracted by the magnetic field of the Earth, it deflected away from magnetic north. He said, aha, that means that electricity thrown, flowing through a wire creates a magnetic field. It's all magnetic field. Wow. Electricity makes magnetism. Soon after that, Michael Faraday from Britain, he said, well, if electricity can make magnetism, hmm, could magnetism make electricity? This was the next discovery. So here's what he did. He took a galvanometer, like Luigi used here, and he hooked up a coil of wire. Notice we have no lemon, no battery source at all. These electrons on these wires here, not moving. They're still. He wanted to use magnets to get those electrons to move. He could generate his own electricity without the stinky, smelly, big batteries of the time. And so, he took his magnets. He took the coil of the wire. And he began working and working and working, trying to figure out how to make the electrons move. Finally, he took the magnets and watched the galvanometer. As I put the magnets through this coil of wire right here, you can see what's happening. This changing magnetic field, as I go in and out of this coil of wire here, causes electrons to move one way and then the other way. This, by the way, is a type of electricity that you use in your home. It's called alternating current. Now that's different than the current that's produced by a battery or a lemon. That's called direct current. So batteries make current that goes one direction. In your homes, you use electricity that goes both ways. It's called AC, that's 120 volts, and it's 60 hertz, meaning it goes back and forth 60 times in one second. Well, stay tuned because we have a few more discoveries to mention to you. Well, now that you learned a little bit about Michael Faraday, let me talk to you about Michael Faraday, the inventor, and he invented this. This is called the electromagnet. How does it work? Well, there's a strong iron core that is wrapped around, uh, that has copper wrapped around each end. So as you can see, it's bent as a U, but the copper wire that's wrapped around it creates a magnetic field when there's a charge that runs through the uh, electromagnet. So right now, if I was to touch the metal bar, you can see there's nothing happening, right? But how would you make this work? Well, you have to put uh, the, a charge through it using this little power supply unit here. And you can see that there's volts and amps that are uh, shown here on the front. And now if I was to touch the metal bar, let's find out what happens. Ah, voila, there you go, it works. So how do you make this stronger? Well, you have to have more copper wire wrapped around the metal core or a bigger core. So if I was to let this, uh, if I was to turn off the power supply, what would happen to the metal bar? What do you think? Let's find out. It dropped. But did you see there was a little bit of a delay there? So when I turned off the power supply, the electrons were still flowing through the wire until eventually it, it uh, ran through and there was no more field and no more charge. All right, well, David and I have something else we wanna show you about electricity. It has to do with this energy stick right here. So watch how this works. If I grab this end of it here, and David grabs this end here, nothing happens. But when I go ahead and touch, not his hand, I'll touch his head. Watch this. Did you hear that? Let's try it again. Now let's try his nose this time here. Hey, he's got a nice button for a nose, doesn't he? So what's going on here? How does this work? This energy tube here, inside of it, We've got some wires, we've got a battery, there's some lights here, and there's a sound emitting diode. But nothing happens until this end is touched right here, and this end, this is aluminum tape. But if you notice that Dave and I both touch it like this, the circuit is not completed because electricity can go through here, through David, but then it stops. But when we touch, we're completing the circuit. So that's how it works. Electricity always likes to go in a complete circuit. If it doesn't have a complete circuit, it doesn't go at all. Well, 
I know that humans can conduct electricity. Anything that conducts electricity is called a conductor, so let's try some other materials. Sounds good. What about this glass straw here? Let's check it out. What do you think? Conductor or insulator? Ah, that's an insulator. An insulator is something that doesn't allow electrons to flow through it. Even though we're connected by this glass right here, electricity does not go through glass at all. That we call an insulator. Well, I'm kind of curious. Would I be safe in a bathtub if I was charging my phone? I've read many articles about that. I don't think it's a good idea. What, let's give it a shot. All right. Okay. You put your hand in there, and I'll put my hand in this part of the water here and see what happens. You ready? I like it. I like it. So you're not safe in the bathtub charging your phone. Electricity loves a complete circuit, right? Well, let's talk about the four parts of a circuit. All of them are pretty essential. So first of all, you have to have a place for electrons to flow. We call that, remember, the conductor. We're going to be using these wires right here. These are alligator clips. You don't want to be bit by these, OK? So we've got our conductors all the way around. The second part we'll talk about is the battery. We have to have some energy. We've got to get the electrons to flow. You see, without a battery, they sit there. They, like bumps on a log, they don't move at all until they're pulled and pushed. So we got the negative end of the battery pushing the, the electrons away. We got the positive in the battery pulling them toward it. Now we can get electrons to flow. I'm going to be using the right battery. I'm going to use three volts here of electricity, two D batteries. All right. So now we've got another part of our circuit, which is called the switch. The switch is convenient because you can turn it on and off. We can make the electricity run, or we can make it stop with our switch. And this is our switch right here. And the last part, we want electricity to be our servants, to do something for us, not just go rah, rah, in a circle like this. That'd be silly. We want it to do something, so we have our load. Our load is what we want the electricity to do, whether it's a light, whether it's a hair dryer, whatever it is. Electricity, in this case, is gonna make, we got a motor here, gonna make this fan go because I'm hot and I need to be cooled down. All right, you ready? Now all I have to do to get this fan to work is to complete the circuit. Right now it is open. I'm gonna shut the circuit. I'm gonna close it. Let's watch and see what happens. You ready? Closed. Boy, this is so exasperating, trying to untangle these, these Christmas lights. Have you ever put your lights up on a tree and have the whole light strand go out? Well, why does it do that? Well, it's because this is a great example of a series circuit. That means that there's only one pathway that goes from one light to the next, but the light, if I pull it out, it breaks the circuit or that pathway. So that means that the electricity is only flowing through one way. That would be crazy to have your whole house wired that way. Thankfully, electricians don't wire a house in a series type circuit. They actually do it in a parallel type circuit. Well, what does that look like? Well, that means that each light bulb, for example, here uh, has its own pathway. So that means that if I take off one of the light bulbs, which I'll show you here, the rest of the light bulbs should stay on. So each light bulb has its own pathway back to the energy source. So the circuit's not broken. So I'm not dependent on the electricity flowing from one light bulb to the other, like this example. So if I pull off a light bulb or unscrew it, it would not discontinue the, the circuit. Let's talk about how lights work here. So how does electricity go into here and get converted into light? That's the question. No, oh, the bigger light bulb. Oh, oh, oh. As I was saying, how does electricity... No, the bigger light bulb. Oh. Oh, one minute. Oh. How's this work? Yay! Okay, so... 
Let's talk about the flow of electrons through this light right here. Now you can see, I hope you can, that there is a, some wires that are coming up through here and they're fairly thick. And as electrons are flowing through here, when I turn the electricity on, they're cruising and they're doing pretty good. They're going pretty fast. Do remember that this is alternating current, so they're going back and forth at 60 times a second. But anyway, something happens though, when they reach the top here, there's this really fine coiled wire called a filament. It's made of tungsten and it is really, really small diameter. It would be like if you've ever had the unpleasant experience of being on an LA freeway that's bumper to bumper, but still going around 65 miles per hour. Well, what if you're cruising on that freeway, doing okay, and all of a sudden, everybody gets diverted off the freeway onto one little exit road? It would be crazy. And that's just what happens when these electrons leave the bigger wire to this skinny filament. It's like all of a sudden, they're all jam-packed together, banging into each other, causing friction and causing heat. Now that's important. That heat causes the atoms inside the filament to get excited, particularly the electrons on the outside. You see, they're going around the atom in, in these orbits, but when they receive the energy from the heat, they bump up to a higher energy level. And when they do, they can't stay there. And so, eventually they come back down to their normal orbit, but they have excess energy that they give off in the form of light. Bing! There goes a photon. Bing! There goes another one. If you have trillions of electrons doing all that at the same time, you've got a bright light. Would you like to see this one here? All right. Sunglasses first. There we go. And let there be light. And a lot of it. I have a problem. I'm trying to complete my circuit and you can see that I'm missing a connection. I can't quite reach it. I know I have my power supply. Uh, I have my switch. Uh, I have my copper pipe going all the way over to my board here. And then I have a wire from my copper pipe to the bell, which is my load. So my load, I got my switch and my power supply. You know what I'm missing? I'm missing a conductor to complete the circuit. What can I do with, uh, without a conductor? Oh, a conductor? Ew. No, not the plastic pipe. This is an insulator. Uh, give me another way. Ah, it's for a different ex experiment. Not the banana. Ah, yet yeah, no, this is a wood stick. That won't work out. I need something. E yes, this will work. This, the slinky's perfect. Why is this so good and these three not? Because this is a conductor. It lets the electrons flow freely where the, the wood uh, yardstick, the banana, and the plastic uh, pipe don't. They hold on to their electrons. They can't move, and that wa that's why we don't use these items for conducting electricity, only metals and other types of uh, materials that are good at letting the electrons flow. So let's see if this is, is going to work now. I'm gonna hook it up to one end of my slinky here. And there we go. And now I'm gonna see if this will hook up here. And I'll put it over my shoulder so you guys can see better. There we go. And I'll do it this way. And let's see if I throw the switch, if the bell will ring. Three, two, one. It works. That's a great example of a connection. We're using a conductor and the four parts of uh, electricity to complete a circuit. There you go. In this demonstration, I'm going to be using the plasma globe. And what's really cool about the plasma globe is that there's a partial vacuum inside. When I turn this on, the Tesla coil is going to separate the electrons from the particles of gas inside, leaving positively charged ions and the electrons looking for a chance to escape. When I put my hand on it, the electricity is going to flow through me and into the ground. Now let's see what happens when I put my hand on it. As you can see, when my hand is not on it, all of these electrons are trying to find a, a chance to escape. But when I put my hand on it, they all go through me and into the ground. 
Let's see what happens when I take this fluorescent tube near the plasma globe. I don't even have to touch the plasma globe. As soon as I get it near, the electric field around it is activating it and causing the light. Let's do one more demonstration with my dad. So now watch what happens when I touch the end right here. Electrons are going to travel from the globe through David to David's hand through the tube, and they're going to stop right here. Why is this up part not lit? It's because the electrons now are going to leave through my hand and go to the ground. Now watch what happens when I slide my hand back and forth. You can see that I'm completing the circuit and the electricity now is going through me. I'm going to try one more thing now. This time, I'm going to go ahead and touch David's hands. What do you think is going to happen? Watch this. Hmm. Can anybody figure out what's going on? We got a little switch here, don't we, David? And so when I touch David's hand, the electricity is a little bit lazy, and the charge, instead of going up through the tube and lighting it, it's going right through me to the ground. So now I, this is called a short circuit, by the way. We've short circuited it. Pretty cool, huh? The reason the charges want to get to the ground has to do with how big the Earth is. These charges all have the same charge. Therefore, they want to get away from each other. And once they reach the ground, there's plenty of room so they can spread out. The Earth is huge. Hey Ben, uh, my hair dryer is broken. The motor's not working for some reason. Why do you need a hair dryer again? For science. Uh, anyway. These motors work how any motors work, using electricity and magnetism. And by now, hopefully you've realized that these are two are actually the same thing. So electricity and magnetism are sometimes called the electromagnetic force. So here we see, let's first look at the flow of electricity through the wire. So the electricity is flowing from the negative end of the battery here through the magnets up through the copper wire and to the positive end. These both work the same way, but what, what do you think is different between these two? Well, this is a smaller battery. It has less voltage, so that's why the wire doesn't spin as fast. It also has less contact with the magnet down here. All right, so we looked at how electricity flows through the battery, but how does these... Why does the motor spin? Well, that happens because there's two competing forces here. The electric field created by the batteries and the magnetic field created by the neodymium magnets at the bottom. And these two forces are pushing against each other. So when they repel each other, they're forcing the copper wire out and it's spinning. And there you have it, a motor. I thought Mr. Franklin said it didn't work. Hey, have you ever thought about how a hair dryer does work? Well, the key to it is a motor inside. I'm going to show you a simple motor that's very similar to the one inside here. And it does work with electricity and magnetism. And guess who discovered it? Michael Faraday. So let's use this cup right here and turn it into a motor. If you notice, I've got a power supply, the battery. I've got some conductors, wires right here. And when I hook this up here, I'm going to have electricity and it's going to be running up through this paper clip, through this coil of wire. And this coil of wire here is going to turn into an electromagnet. Do you remember what happens when electricity goes through a coil of wire? It becomes magnetic. Now, right beneath it is another magnet. That magnet is a permanent magnet. And you know what happens when you have two magnets and you have a north end and a north end and you try to put them together, mm, that doesn't work very well. They repel each other, and that's what's gonna happen. This magnet here is gonna repel this magnet here and get it to start turning. Now there's a little bit more complicated science behind it because if it just repelled it, it would go like this one turn and it would stay that way. So what we've done is we have gone and sanded one side of this wire right here so it's a conductor. The other side is not a conductor. So when it spins halfway, it's no longer an electromagnet anymore. It's not carrying current. And it, then its momentum carries it this way back again. Now it repels it. So on and on and on. Let's see how it works, okay? Oh 
baby, go. So here you have a simple motor. Now, we're combining electricity and magnetism, and we have the beauty of motion. All we need is a little bit of power here, coil of wire, and some permanent magnets. And that's how motors work. Pretty cool, huh? In reviewing the parts of a circuit, I, I want to do one more demonstration for you. So let's see if we've got everything we need. I've got my power supply right here. It's 120 volts. I've got a switch right here on and off. And I have a conductor, this wire right here. It's going to carry my electricity. What am I missing? Let's see. Something for the electricity to do. I need a load. Hey, load! Uh, tangerine, uh, no. Apple? Electricity? Load? Nah. There's the banana again. No, no, not the banana. Uh, let's see what else you got. A pickle. Hey. Hmm. I think I've got an idea. Let's go ahead and plug our pickle in to 120 volts here. And let's see what happens when I turn this switch on. Okay. Good. Little, little juicy guy there. All right. Are you ready to see what happens when 120 volts go through this pickle? This is our load. Let's see what kind of work it can do. Here we go. I hear something. Oh, and I smell something. Pickles are juicy. Those juices contain ions. Those are charged particles, which are great conductors of electricity. And as electricity flows through our pickle, it's going to heat it up. And as those atoms inside the pickle get hot, they're going to act like atoms in a filament of a light bulb. They're going to begin to glow. The electrons will move up to a higher energy level, and then come back down, and then give off little photons of light. So we'll keep watching to see this pickle begin to glow. Thank you.